Chairman of American University's Islamic Studies Program, visited Muslim communities in 75 towns and cities in the U.S. During his trip, he found out the views of people on various topics, including religion, terrorism, and American politics. Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, D.C. hosts the hour-long event. Okay, I'm Barbara Mead. I'm one of the owners here at Politics and Prose. And this evening, I have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Dr. Professor Akbar Ahmed back to Politics and Prose. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed has been here probably four or five times, I think, uh, since uh, he arrived in the United States in 2001, <laughs> which is when I first met him. Um, he holds the uh, Ibn Khaldun Chair of Islamic Studies at American University. And um, he invited me to his installation. This is back in 2001. And it was certainly an impressive affair that he had Muslim scholars for, from all over the world flying in for his installation. And <clears throat> I just knew uh, at that moment that we were going to see great things of the future from uh, Professor Ahmed. And that has occurred. Um, he also, since that time, he has been uh, uh, named the uh, distinguished. He's the distinguished chair of Middle East and Islamic Studies at the Naval Academy, and now, according to the BBC, he is the world's leading authority on contemporary Islam, and he's also known as one of Pakistan's most. Is a companion study to his journey into Islam that came out three years ago. Uh, Professor Ahmed, uh, he was wearing his anthropologist hat for this, I think, gathered together a research team composed mostly of his students to visit over 75 cities and 100 mosques to study the American Muslim community. Uh, they're actually now at the American Muslim community uh, includes, uh, excuse me, nearly seven million Muslims in this country. Um, his team also conducted some 2,000 interviews during this uh, nine-month period, and the interviews range from uh, an academic such as Noam Chomsky to a stripper in Las Vegas. That was a Muslim, a Muslim stripper in Las Vegas. Is that right? I not guess not in Las Vegas. Uh, in, not in Las Vegas. Um, uh, I want to give you just one quote from the uh, uh, Pac Pakistan uh, paper, the Daily Times, which was published in Lahore, uh, saying about this book: "The expanse and depth of journey into America is difficult to accurately portray." Muslims and non-Muslims, especially in leadership positions, must own a copy, dog ear it, and return it for the and, re, and ter, return to it for the treasure house of information and sharp analysis that it is. It will be the talk of the town, and you would not want to be left out. So he, here is Professor Ahmed. Thank you, Barbara. You've been such a friend and patron over these years. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and this really is a very, very distinguished audience, I can assure you. To me, as a bibliophile, there is no better place to spend your time than with friends and among books. And I'm delighted that politics and prose provides both and has provided both over the years. So thank you to pol politics and prose, and thank you all for coming. I have many friends here, but there's one very special friend, a spiritual mentor, the Reverend Clark Lubinstein. As you know, he's Mr. Interfaith. In fact, um, he gave me and my friends, Bishop John Chain and Rabbi Lustig, the first ever Interfaith Award for Washington, D.C. And I would like to request him, and I don't want to violate any 
separation of church and state and so on in the United States and get involved in a controversy. But I would like to request him to offer a blessing, an ecumenical blessing for the book and for the gathering and for promoting peace and dialogue. And in case you're thinking I'm just hedging my bet as a Muslim and hoping that the Christian God may listen to me, the, Re the Reverend Clark, in fact, is a colleague and a friend, and he, in fact, presided over my son's wedding. Reverend Clark, can we have you up here for a few minutes? Will you join me in a word of silence and a word of prayer, as your tradition indicates? Holy, merciful, all-wise, and all-loving God, source of all truth, we gather this day gracious for the privilege of being here, for the hospitality of politics and prose, for the enormous scholarship which Dr. Akbar Ahmed has brought to us. Open our hearts, but especially open our minds this day, for we will be challenged, and we give you thanks that we will be challenged. We will learn, and we give you thanks that we will learn. And we will explore together the wonders both of Islam and of America. In all things, may we give you thanks. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Clark, for that beautiful prayer. Barbara, I recall being here almost a decade back. Zenith, my wife who's over here, and I had just arrived in Washington, D.C. We were strangers in town. We knew very few people. And 9-11 happened. I was in class that day. And immediately the tension and the anger was palpable to any Muslim living here. And I remember coming here, invited by Barbara to be on a panel, a very distinguished panel. I was still new enough not to know the panelists. There was E.J. Dion and all sorts of big names. But I remember the tension in the air. I had become the lightning rod. Anything named Ahmed or Khan or Chaudhry was drawing so much animosity. And I said to myself, I said, my next couple of years are going to be dedicated with passion, with commitment to trying to bridge this gap that I saw opening up. Because I said, if America's in trouble and America goes into a certain direction, it will take the world with it. This was going to be a big challenge to anyone like me. I don't want to sound pompous or immodest, but I am an anthropologist. I have been an administrator in the Muslim world. I am a scholar of Islam, and I'm chair of Islamic studies at American University. I could not sit it out. I could not say, well, this is not my battle. It was my battle to improve understanding, build bridges, create better friendship, create more harmony between Muslims and mainstream Americans. And that is exactly what I did over the years. But I based this friendship and dialogue on scholarship and knowledge. It wasn't just me saying, we love you, you love us, and therefore we are friends, because that won't do. And too many Muslims, unfortunately, were saying exactly that. Islam means peace, Islam is love, Islam is compassion. And there was no explanation of either what happened on 9-11 or what was happening in the Muslim world. So it left everyone feeling more frustrated. The gap did not close with that kind of explanation. Therefore, I felt as a scholar, all our dialogues and friendship efforts and initiatives had to rest in scholarship. And since that day, believe me, I don't think I've rested one 24-hour cycle. It's been the media or lectures or conferences or meetings or writing or a series of activity. It's just been nonstop. Uh, we've had a series of plays, books, articles over these years. It was like embarking on a very exciting journey. For me, it was almost like a crusade. And on this journey, I met many, many very inspiring people, really inspiring people, meeting them for the first time here in, in the United States. I mentioned my friends uh, Bishop John Chain or the Reverend Clark Lobenstein or, Bishop, or Rabbi Lustig of the Washington Hebrew Congregation. We all became great friends, uh, Zenith, my wife, the family, all of us. And of course, my colleagues on campus, the professors and the students, those wonderful students, uh, the honor students, uh, Frankie and Haley were here and joined my team, uh, young Jonathan, who was from Alabama and the son of a great friend of mine, Ambassador Doug Holliday. 
and Secretary Dalton, of course, is another part uh, member of that group. So Jonathan joined us and joined the team. These are the people I was meeting. This was America, another face of America that I was seeing, who on this journey helped me to create better understanding. But like that Greek character, you recall, who would work all night and complete the task, and in the morning he was back to square one. I felt like that. I really felt like that character, that the more you tried, the harder you worked, you still were back to square one. And therefore, there was no rest. There was absolutely no rest. Yet I endured, like another Greek. You remember Ulysses by Tennyson. That was the kind of emotion that was driving me to this. Remember the lines, some of my favorite lines in poetry. Yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world that fades forever and forever when I move. To follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bounds of human thought. To strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. It was the same spirit that urged the passengers on the Mayflower to cross the Atlantic. It was the same spirit that drove the Americans across the continent, this great continent in the 19th century, drove them to become scientists and explorers, to go to the moon. It is a spirit, as the Reverend Clark pointed out, also contained in Islam. Islam emphasizes knowledge above all things. The word knowledge in Islam is ilm, and ilm has been used more often in the Quran than any other word except the word for God. That's how Islam, how much Islam emphasizes knowledge. The Prophet of Islam said, the ink of the scholar is more sacred than the blood of the martyr. So these are sayings that to me as a Muslim scholar also inspired me and fed me into the sense of having to do something. And on this journey, I can for the record say, and I know that C-SPAN is covering this, that I found nothing but friendship and warmth and welcome from America. This is what I found. My wife, Zenith, who's now a, a realtor working here in Washington, my son, uh, Babar, who's a filmmaker, found exactly the same friendship and the same warmth from the people of America. Yet, there is a problem. We cannot avoid that. There is a problem in the US, in US relations with the Muslim world. And let's look at why Islam is so important for Americans to understand and understand correctly in an objective manner, in a scholarly manner, not emotionally. Here are some reasons. First of all, self-interest. America today has young men and women, many of them my students, many of them your family members in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, interacting in Somalia, hundreds of thousands. Surely we here in America need to understand the religion of these countries that they, are find, they find themselves in. There are about 7 million Muslims here in the United States. Already we have two congressmen who are Muslim. We have this new phenomena, the homegrown terrorist. What is this phenomena? What do we know about the homegrown terrorist? Who is influencing them? Why is their family failing? Why are their leaders failing in the community? Who is training the imams who train them? Where is this failure taking place? Why should young men want to blow up their own country, this, this country that uh, people really strain so hard and try so hard to come to as immigrants, and yet they're trying to damage this country? These are big questions that need to be answered, and we can only answer them if we understand Islam. And then, real politik. The United States is a superpower. There are other superpowers in the world also, emerging superpowers. And Muslims constitute 1.4 billion in population. That's the number of the Muslims, very, very roughly, but that's roughly the number, the demographic number at this moment in time. That means one out of four people on this planet are Muslim. Something like 57, 58 countries are Muslim. Surely we need to understand this huge population, one-fourth of the world. We cannot simply be constantly in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a relationship of conflict with them. And finally, and for me, perhaps the most important point for an American to understand Islam, because it is American to understand other cultures and other religions. Read the Founding Fathers, right from Washington, straight through Jefferson, Franklin, Adams, all of these extraordinary men 
constantly emphasized religious pluralism, religious tolerance. Go to Virginia and you see this uh, statue outside the university that Jefferson created, a statue with an angel holding a tablet and it says religious freedom, 1786. The word God, then Jehovah, so Christianity, Judaism, Allah for Islam. And not to stop there, it goes on, Brahma, Atma, just think of it. In the 18th century, and look at the world, look at what's happening in the rest of the world. There are dictators and there are all kinds of uh, dynasties and all kinds of tyrannies in government throughout the world. And here in the United States, these extraordinary figures are creating a new kind of society which rests in notions of civil liberties, human rights, but above all, religious tolerance and acceptance. And these people are thinking beyond Christianity, beyond even Judaism, beyond Islam even, and all of these are Abrahamic. They're also reaching out to non-Abrahamic peoples. What a remarkable tri tribute to the human spirit. So that is one reason why Americans also need to understand Islam, because Islam is very much part of this great world faiths that we have welcomed through the spirit of the founding fathers. A word or two about the book itself. The book is, above all, rooted in the anthropological method. I am an anthropologist. I am a trained anthropologist. This is not the traditional anthropological study, which, as you know, is usually a small community or a small village or some um, group in Africa or Asia or wherever. This is the study of a continent. This is the study of a community, the Muslim community in America today at a moment in time, at this moment in time. And because we are studying the Muslim community, we are also studying American society and culture. So we are not looking at Muslim society in a vacuum. We are looking at it in the context of America today. And to, in order to involve a scholar like me in a project like this, it took me several years to complete this project. So it took about a year to prepare for it, a year in the field, doing field work, and not a year, but a very, very quick couple of months writing up the book and then Brookings Press and I give them full marks, had the book out literally in a couple of weeks and I'm just taken aback at the speed and efficiency with which they did this. And the book, as Barbara pointed out, is the second half of this project, Journey into Islam and then Journey into America, both looking at the relationship between the United States and the Muslim world. And we really found that unless you looked at the Muslim community in the United States and American attitudes to Islam, you could not really understand that relationship. That is why I spent so much time looking at um, the Muslim community in America. It is also a mirror, holding a mirror to society. An anthropologist, that is the anthropological method, holds up a mirror and says, here is society today. He may have some empathy, he may have some sympathy, he may have affection for that society. No person spends a year or two or three of his, his or her life in studying a society unless they have a lot of respect and affection for that society. But as a social scientist, the anthropologist must be absolutely objective or it's not a correct picture. So therefore, as Barbara said, we have a whole range of interviews. And some of them will really surprise you. Uh, I hope a lot of them will amuse you and a lot of them will impress you. So it is a snapshot of America today. A curiosity here is that usually American anthropologists go out to the Muslim world and study the natives over there. And I had the pleasure, the distinct pleasure of reversing that trend and coming here and studying you, uh, the natives here. <laughs> and very friendly I might, might add here, very friendly natives. <laughs> We, of course, were involved in what anthropologists call participant observation, which means that we immersed ourselves in, in the society. When we were traveling, we would stay with Muslim families. We would fast with them. We would um, say prayers with them. We would understand them. We would talk to them for hours and hours, do face-to-face -face interviews. And that is what is contained in the book, possibly the first study of its kind. There are some excellent studies. Uh, I can recommend many. They are referred to in my book. But of its kind, this is probably one of the very, very few studies, which is a field study of Muslims in America today and very rich in terms of ethnography. Along with fieldwork, it is also a book on international relations, 
on issues of security, issues of terrorism. Don't forget that Faisal Shahzad in his bungled attempt in New York, wanting to uh, blow up things in New York, actually cited, he didn't cite the Quran, he didn't cite any theological arguments, which is what our experts tell us all the time, that Muslims are potentially all geared to blow themselves up, it's in our D DNA and so on. Don't believe them, read my book. <laughs> Faisal Shahzad was actually quoting the drone strikes in the tribal areas in Pakistan. So we are seeing some very interesting patterns and why people like Faisal Shahzad are then tempted to do violent, stupid, idiotic things like wanting to harm his own people, that is America. But his, in his mind, he was connecting his situation here with the situation in Pakistan. And I may add as a parenthesis that when you talk to Pakistanis, they are very discontented with this so-called war on terror. Because they say we had nothing to do with 9-11. We had nothing to do with what happened subsequently. And yet we have lost 30,000 people in this war. 30,000 Pakistanis have died. And the place in some provinces, like the frontier province, is, is a complete mess. It's in turmoil. That's the blowback they're facing. The Taliban are in control in many parts of the districts of the frontier province, which has never happened in history. There have been pitched battles for states, uh, for districts like Swat, where the Taliban took over the whole district, then had to be cleaned out by the army. And you can imagine what it does to ordinary Pakistanis. They're first being killed by the Taliban, then there's an army action. Uh, again, they're being killed. Uh, there's food shortages. The prices are very high. And the sense of anger and disillusionment, why are we being sucked into this, is very, very high. And it is not surprising that anti-Americanism is absolutely at a peak in Pakistan today. Talk to the people of Pakistan, read the editorials and the comments. So again, these are things that concern us. What happens here in the United States does not stay here. It has an impact overseas. Then you have, of course, the media here. The discussion of Islam. This is a free society and it must remain a free society and we salute the notion and practice of a free society. But Muslims will tell you, and I will share this with you, Muslims will tell you, privately if not publicly, that when we talk of our God, our Prophet, our customs, our culture being attacked, we are told, well, this is a free society, this democracy, that's how we function. And that's great. We applaud that. But do you have the same rules when you say something about the African-American community or the Jewish community? There's an uproar then. The slightest comment creates an uproar. And it should be. We should be very sensitive to each other to each other's religions and cultures. But why are Muslims exempt from this great rule of democracy and freedom of expression? Ask yourselves this question. It's open season for Muslims. You can abuse them, kick them, say anything, and get away with it. Surely, as Americans, you should be very concerned about this, because these are citizens of the United States of America. And unless we do something to integrate them and bring them back into the mainstream, give them a sense of confidence, we will have problems from the community. And this homegrown terrorist phenomena, to me as an anthropologist, reflects this sense of disquiet, which I'm not happy about at all. As a father, as someone living in Washington, I'm very concerned about it. So I hope that this book will generate some fresh thinking. We've got some really rich ethnography and their conclusions and recommendations at the end to deal with precisely this. Now, of course, I must mention the team that traveled with me that worked on this project and contributed to it. Because without them, this project would not have been completed and would not have the quality that it did have. Two of them, uh, Frankie and Haley, I mentioned, were my honor students at American University and were with me on the first project. And this one, like, was Jonathan. So these are the three um, core, core members of the team. And since then, of course, uh, Frankie's uh, going on to England. He's planning to do an MA there and then a PhD. I'm delighted and I'm glad that Jonathan is staying on, probably feeling sorry for his old boss. He's, everyone's deserting him, so he's staying on to hold my hand, make sure I don't collapse. Uh, Haley, in the meantime, has become a research director at a new center, which is uh, uh, Georgetown plus, plus the UAE. She just uh, was in Egypt for a conference and now is flying off to Morocco for another conference and on to China then. So she's contributing at a very high level and we are all very, very proud of what these youngsters, young Americans are doing. Craig, the young uh, student of mine, another former student who made the film, 
is going on to do a PhD again in, um, in uh, I think he's going to Ireland, isn't that right, Jonathan? Ireland, Ireland. So you can see that the team and you as Americans, if you have any doubts, I know there's a lot of anger and confusion and some uncertainty abroad in America, and you're seeing evidence of that uh, in the media and the discussions and controversies. If you have any need to cheer you up and you want confidence and optimism and commitment and faith, see what this team did. Literally, they went through such a grueling period of field work and came through in the end. Consistent hard work because they were driven by an idea of contributing to American society in a way they felt they could do with other Americans couldn't. And I was fortunate, otherwise think of me wandering around in a small town in Alabama and asking questions about security and terrorism and homegrown terrorism. So luckily I had the team to keep an eye on me. We are of course in the book raising some big questions. And again, as a very sophisticated American audience, I want you to think about these big questions. The first big question, a conundrum which unfortunately is not debated in the open. We may feel it, but I haven't really heard a debate about it. Here's a huge conundrum that we as Americans face squarely, head on like this, and we don't recognize it. It's the big gorilla in the room. How are we to treat the Muslim world? What is the policy? From the Muslim point of view, the Muslims see America as, on the one hand, very generous, great donors. Pakistan, I think you're giving um, a billion and a half uh, for the next five years. Mark, is that right? Is that the figure? That's the famous Mark Siegel at the back there, who did that great project with our lamented great um, leader, Benazir Bhutto. So a billion and a half for five years, very generous. But with the other hand, a slap on the face an insult, a humiliation. So the Muslim world is in a state of complete uncertainty as to what America intends doing with it. What is the relationship? Is it respect and dignity, which is what General Petraeus, the late lamented General McChrystal, Colonel David Kilcullen, all these extraordinary, excellent officers, and I have the highest respect for them, and I've had the pleasure of meeting some of them, they have emphasized that you deal with the Muslim world through these words, dignity, I'm quoting them, and respect, I'm quoting them again. Because if you get the population on your side, you automatically marginalize the Taliban or the Al-Qaeda, or as we would in America with all our sophistication of analysis call the bad guys. <laughs> now, if we can do this, we automatically ensure our position in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and so on. That's one position. Opposed to this, directly, contradictory, other end of the spectrum, is the other position, where we believe we are in a clash of civilizations. And remember, our experts have been telling us this since 9-11, and we've all been believing it. Islam is evil. Islam creates terrorism. The Quran is evil. It does nothing but preach violence, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, you can't have these two attitudes and ideas about a civilization in one frame. If you have them, you are creating a great deal of tension and conflict within yourself and then through how policy is being implemented. This is the great American conundrum and I hope, I hope that either you or my young uh, students go on and resolve it. And unless you resolve it, we'll have a very unhappy America in dealing with the Muslim world and an equally unhappy Muslim world. There's another issue, big question in this book, and that is how do we as Americans maintain and reinforce and honor the extraordinary ideals of those extraordinary figures, the founding fathers of America? Those are extraordinary pe people, and I mentioned the religious pluralism plank in their vision of the world. How do we balance that with the notion of this society feeling a sense of threat? a security threat. This balance between torturing people or torturing suspects and maintaining the idea of human dignity and civil liberties. And again, if you have any doubts about this, read your founding fathers on torture, on civil liberties, on religious pluralism. It's all there and it's brilliant and it's very inspiring. And for someone like me, coming from outside, it gives me so much hope and so much faith in the human condition and in humanity itself. Finally, 
a big question. How does a minority, like the Muslim minority, adjust with the majority in a time of change and crisis? The Muslim minority after 9-11 is under a microscope. And we have so many case studies in the book. You will be amazed at the material you re read in the book. On the one hand, inspiring. On the other hand, challenging. How do we balance the minority with the majority? How do we integrate them or assimilate them or give them that kind of confidence that, that they join us? I'll conclude by giving you some findings from the field. Number one, these are just some random findings from the field. Some of the best Americans are Muslim. I repeat this. Some of the best American, uh, Americans are Muslims. Soldiers, police officers, lawyers, doctors. We saw soldiers. We went to Arlington, Arlington Cemetery, and we saw Muslim soldiers buried there. Arabs, Pakistanis, buried with honor, with the, the, the great honors that America can give its own people. Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, I, because I, he's a great hero of mine, I look up to him and I honor him. I found on this journey, as did my team, so many Muslims citing Thomas Jefferson as one of their role models, as one of their idols. Now, isn't that amazing? To get a Muslim saying, who are your role models? Thomas Jefferson. Very unlikely. If I had asked you this, you would have thought unlikely. That is American Muslims. Number two, findings from the field. The diversity of Islam in America. Now, we know in the media when people talk of Islam in America, they talk of it as a monolith. Very often I'm asked, you know, you Muslims do this, you Muslims do that. And it's not Muslim, it's Muslim. And when they look at me, they assume we are all alike. Now, we may look all alike, but we are not. This is a global community. There are Muslims in America, literally from all the corners of this globe. Muslims from Morocco, from Bangladesh, from India, from Pakistan, from Egypt, from all over this globe. So keep this in mind. And these communities have brought their very rich cultures to America. They've joined the American feast. The tradition here is always immigrants from Ireland, from the Jewish communities coming from East Europe and so on, bringing their rich cultures to America. This is what the Muslims have done. Number three, Islam remains a very fast-growing religion in the United States of America. Paradoxically, after 9-11, sales for the Quran just rocketed. Americans are a curious people. They wanted to know what is this religion that's so much in the news, which is so controversial. And one of the very interesting things that I found as an anthropologist, we were looking at figures of converts, American converts, white converts to Islam. African Americans, we have a full chapter on African American uh, Muslims. Fascinating chapter. We were very impressed by some of the African American Imams. Unfortunately, they don't get the importance and coverage that they should be getting. They're very wise, very sensible Americans and Muslims. But I was fascinated by white women converting to Islam because I discovered, according to the statistics, that three out of four converts to Islam are women. And I asked myself, and I told my team, go and find the answers. Why should a white woman, with all the freedom and facilities and living in this um, incredibly affluent and important society, the superpower of the world, give up a way of life and put on an alien dress to her, an alien dress, and live a restricted life. Here's a great challenge for an anthropologist. And if you want to know the answer, it's chapter 6. <laughs> another point, another finding for you. In the media, the assumption is, it may be implicit, not explicit, the assumption is that Islam is somehow a sort of post 9-11 phenomena or some of these Middle East or South Asian Muslim immigrants arrived here uh, three decades ago. Wrong. Islam was here right at the start, right at the start of the United States of America. And it came via Africa. 30 to 40 percent of the Africans who were brought here in those horrible slave ships and those terrible tragedies were actually Muslim. And many of them were scholars, they were imams, they were chiefs, they were noblemen. They crossed the Atlantic and here, of course, they were pushed into this new identity as slaves. 
And one of the most fascinating case studies in this book is when we, the team, we crossed the Atlantic, not much of a journey, but it was in a very rickety little uh, boat, and I was, wasn't sure whether we'd survive the journey, to a, an island called Sapelo Island off the state of Georgia. And when, when we arrived there, we completely broke off all communication. The cell phones wouldn't work, and Frankie started feeling very nervous about all the moss trees. He'd been reading about all the voodoo and so on in that part of the country. He's from the north, so don't, don't blame him too much. And he began to say, I'm feeling you know, absolutely freaked out what's going on here, because all communication was lost. And that night, we spent the evening talking to Mrs. Bailey, a wonderful, very charismatic woman, who's the direct descendant, now think of this, 10 generations down from Bilali Muhammad, an African slave, a very wise African brought as a slave to America around the turn of the century, 17th to 18th century, 18th to 19th century, so around 1800, 1801 and two. And again, as an anthropologist, I was fascinated. How does a community, he's Muslim and a devout Muslim, how does he preserve his culture in the face of a very brutal attempt to completely exterminate that culture. New name, new religion, new language. He must not have any or give any hint of any other culture except the one imposed on him. And we discovered and we made notes uh, after a conversation and moving around Saplo Island, about two dozen, two dozen substantial pieces of evidence of how one generation would pass on something of Islam, it was fading over the generations, onto the next generation, onto the next, onto the next, up to Mrs. Bailey, who of course is Christian. But these customs, these traditions, slowly fading, but still maintained today, and you can see them. It was incredible, it's very rich material, so you'll find that there. So Islam, remember, is not a new phenomena. It goes back, and we are giving you evidence. Then, of course, we did not look at just Muslims in America. I have an entire chapter on Muslims and Jews. And the subtitle is Bridging a Great Divide. And I give examples of some of the wonderful people I've personally met and been conducting a dialogue with, including Professor Judea Pearl, the father of Danny Pearl, who was so tragically uh, killed in uh, Karachi. So we give examples of Jewish-Muslim dialogue, the need for this dialogue, and the similarities between these two religions. And let me say this on record. I found there are no two religions which are more similar than Judaism and Islam. It's amazing for me. And when I talk to a rabbi, when I talk to Bruce Lustig, for example, really to me he's a very enlightened kind of imam. I see very little difference between what an imam, uh, an enlightened imam would be saying and what he says in his learning, in his wisdom, in his compassion. And yet there are challenges. We know there are challenges. Then there's another chapter called Muslims and Mormons. Subtitle, Getting to Know You, and you recall your musicals. Again, fascinating. The Mormons, when we moved uh, to Palmyra and went up to Utah, we found the Mormons very welcoming us, but specifically welcoming the Muslims in the team. They would really reach out, and I was taken aback. I said, this, this is the, you know, am I in America? Where have I gone? Because, you know, normally Muslims are always seen with some suspicion and some uh, reservation. And... I discovered that the Mormons have, from the birth of their religion in the 19th century, looked on Muslims as a kind of, with a kind of affinity, with a kind of empathy, and that their prophet, Joseph Smith, in the 19th century was dubbed and called the Yankee Muhammad. Now, people don't know these things. The, the amount of similarities that they consciously build up between Islam and uh, Mormonism, again, you'll find that there, uh, there's an entire chapter. And finally, of course, we have emphasized again and again, because it is so important to emphasize this in America today, the importance of safeguarding the idea and the ideal of America. Losing this pluralist identity is our greatest threat, not terrorism. And this came through again and again in the questionnaires. Americans, we must never underestimate Americans. This is a very wise and very sensible population. We assume things sitting here in Washington, that this is how America thinks, this is what America will say. 
in the field, we found in our interviews, Americans telling us again and again, we'd, we'd assume this, what is the greatest threat? We'd assume they're going to say terrorism, or Muslims, or you, looking at me. But they didn't. Again and again, they talk of education, or losing this cultural, religious pluralism. Sophisticated answers. And this is right across the board, across America. So uh, as we traveled, we, s we saw this. And, um, the big cities and small towns again and again. And we did have the uh, advantage, as I described my team, that the boys would go off and the girls would go off and talk to one-to-one -to -one with people, spend hours and hours. So they would come back with a lot of very rich uh, data for their, with their interviews intact. So with that, let me thank all of you for being here. And once again, thank Barbara. And I know you want to uh, rush off to buy the books. But <laughs> before that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. and. Uh, I do want to make one announcement before we go into the Q&A session uh, amongst our group of supporters and team members uh, is Mary Beth, and I believe she's, been, uh, she's got engaged this evening to Nick. So Mary Beth, where are you? Let, let us see you. Where is she? Right here. Where is Mary Beth? Ah, here she is. Mary Beth, stand up and show yourself. <laughs> and Mary Beth, where is the lucky man, Nick? Now, Nick, please look after her, okay? She's very special to American University. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, people with questions, please use the mic here, right here. Hello, uh, <laughs> thank you for your work. I'm a sociologist, and it's similar to anthropology. Um, I uh, want to ask a question about the context or the culture in, with, in which Muslim Islam is found. I believe it was your previous book that we discussed here in a book group. And what I got from there was that Islam is practiced differently depending on the culture in which it's found. Okay, that's correct. Okay, I had difficulty explaining that, conveying that to the rest of the book group because they said all Muslims are terrorists. But my question though on this book is, did you find Mus Muslim practice differently? You, you, you're getting there, Muslim. Gently Muslim. <laughs> you know, let me quote Muhammad Ali, the boxer. I think he was on Oprah and she said Muslim and he said, look, Muslim is a piece of cloth. I'm a Muslim. So, you know, he's very witty. Let me just quote him. <laughs> is it practiced differently around the U.S. depending on the village, the culture, the, the setting in which they live? This is a, a great question and again, we need to step back and not look at Muslims as a monolith. We drew three broad categories, and these are very broad and very crude. The African Americans, these are the original Muslims, and in fact, I call them the first Muslims in the United States. Now, they are American. They have lived here for centuries. They're part of this culture. They have contributed to this culture. I don't have to remind you that we have uh, the first um, uh, African-American uh, descendant um, in the White House. And their contribution to every field of human endeavor in America is remarkable. So these are American Muslims, the African-Americans. Then you have the immigrant Muslims. I'm talking about the differences in terms of the Muslim community. The immigrants are quite distinct. So you have immigrants from the Middle East. You have immigrants from South Asia. You may have immigrants from Malaysia, Indonesia. Now, in one sense, they're all the same. Like in one sense, Christians are the same. Maybe even more similar to other religions. At the same time, there are differences in food, in clothing, in languages, and in how they adjust to America. Thirdly, you have the white converts. Again, very distinct. And we found, for example, here the differences begin to show up. If immigrants are arguing with white converts and they say something about America, oh, we don't like American culture or something, the white convert is going to or likely to say, wait a minute, this is my culture. I may be a Muslim, but I love these films which are Hollywood made or I, I'm very much part of the political process, so don't speak against my country. So you see this interesting little nuance here. So I would say yes, on one level, on a conceptual level, similar. On a sociological level, 
distinct differences. And that is how all societies are. You can't assume Christians are all the same or uh, the Jewish community is the same or Buddhism is the same. Um, it's exactly like that. Oh, and, and could you, Salaam Alaikum, could you also introduce yourself so we know who you are? My name is Zarina Shakir. I'm the producer and host of a television program called Perspectives of Inner Faith and um, newly elected member, Dr. Lewinstein, of the um, Interfaith Conference of Metropolitan Washington. Um, and also just completed a program at Hartford Seminary as a Muslim woman. Um, what I wanted to say was, um, it's very quick, I'm so glad that you were able to cover so many areas with the book. And I just want to say that when I was up in Hartford, Connecticut, one of the blessings of being up there was being able to go to one of the masjids. I went to several, but one of the masjids that had Bosnian Muslims. And there were over 200 Bosnian men that were at this masjid. So as I look around this room, most of them look like the men in here. And I asked the question, how do people know that you're Muslim? How do they differentiate? Because you look like just a regular white guy. And, <laughs> and they said that we are trying to let people know who we are by the things that we do here at this particular masjid. And, um, and it was just an amazing new masjid that had opened in 2007. But what I want to ask you, Dr. Ahmed, is what I asked you when we were over at, um, I think it was the National Cathedral. I want to get you on our television program and would like to get the book, okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Zarina. Always a pleasure, we're always available. I'd be honored to come on your show. And uh, Zarina, I do want to point out that one of the remarkable, for me, because I had met him and honored to have met him, uh, Imam W.D. Muhammad, but for my team was to discover him. This, and most Americans, Arena, I say this with great regret, have no idea who he is. And I call him in the book, and listen to this very carefully because I'm an anthropologist, I choose my words. I call Imam W.D. Muhammad the Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., but Martin Luther of Islam in America. This man literally is responsible for turning Islam around like an oil tanker in the ocean and making it a religion which today reaches out, is involved in interfaith activity, is reaching out to the synagogues and the churches, and is thriving in this environment today. This is the African-American Muslim community headed by Imam W.D. Muhammad. And his story is so remarkable because he's the son, or was the son, because uh, both have died, of Elijah Muhammad, the founder of the Nation of Islam. And Imam W.D. was ostracized by his own father for wanting this kind of Islam, so more uh, uh, reaching out and more accepting version of Islam. So you can see that this, this great spiritual leader, this giant, needs to be discovered by mainstream America. And I'm hoping that this book again will trigger that kind of uh, reaction. Zarina, as far as the Bosnians are concerned, we had several Bosnians telling us, you're right, they look Europe, they are European. They all come from uh, Europe, you know, the blue-eyed blonde people. But they did tell us, when in our private conversations, they said for, with us, right color, wrong religion. <laughs> they said, we have no problem as long as you keep quiet and don't mention our names. But when they start chatting and say, okay, so what's your name? So Muhammad or Ahmed? He said, everything changes. So, you know, it is there and we need to be aware of it. Secretary Dalton. Uh, yes, sir, Dr. Uh, Akbar Ahmed. I'm John Dalton and I'm pleased to be here. and. Uh, I've been a big fan of yours since we first met shortly after 9-11 when several of us met uh, at the Treasury Department and started the Buxton Initiative. And uh, I commend you on your production of your book and look forward to, to reading it. Uh, in your remarks, you talked about the similarities that you learned between Muslims and Jews and Muslims and Mor Mormons, but I also know that you worked, uh, you've worked with the Christian faith community generally a lot with Bishop John Shane at the National Cathedral. I also remember when Dr. Louis Palau was here for his festival, you had a program with him. Could you talk about the similarities that, uh, with in terms of Christianity more generally? Thank you, Secretary Dalton, and thank you for your work and leadership in the interfaith uh, initiatives that you and our friend Ambassador Doug Holliday and Gene and Steve Case have taken over the years. 
uh, you have really played a critical role in America's um, history, which I don't think a lot of Americans know about, but you helped change the dynamic here in Washington, D.C. For me, uh, the r dialogue with Christianity was a very easy one. The reason being that I had the privilege and honor of being educated first at the Catholic school up in North Pakistan, one of the best schools then, and Foreman Christian College in Lahore, run by Presbyterian uh, ministers from America. So I had a good idea of Christianity and its generosity and compassion and its openness to other cultures and other peoples. These were my teachers and we looked up to them. So when this crisis took place on 9-11 and the, the, the whole world uh, changed for us, I didn't have a problem in simply teaming up with, as Secretary Dalton pointed out, Bishop John Chain. Uh, John and I became great friends, and his wife and Zenat became great friends. And of course, Rabbi Lustig was the third, as I, some newspaper, I don't know which one, called the spiritual, uh, three spiritual musketeers. <laughs> and we became great friends because we really saw no difference. In fact, very often in these interfaith meetings, when people would ask about Islam, and I as an anthropologist would be a little bit analytic or even critical about Muslim society, because I'd say, look, Islam is great, it's got all these great ideas like any religion. But Muslim society is really going through a crisis. 57 nations, how many are dictatorships? How many of these countries are ruled by really corrupt and incompetent people? It would be John who'd sort of pull me back and say, no, wait a minute, you know, Islam is our brother religion and so on and so on. Because of his great affection and his great spirit as a Christian. And Secretary Dalton, let me tell you, it's in the book, because John has discussed there's a kind of certain, and Doug Holliday has certain kinds of uh, American Christians who radiate, who radiate uh, the pluralism of the Founding Fathers. There was a moment in time which I, John really staggered me. It's in the book, so I might as well make it public. On a Christmas, I get a card from Bishop John Chain, which has Christianity, birth of Jesus, and so on, celebrating that. Judaism, fine. And then Islam and talking of the holy prophet of Islam. And the Quran is a sacred book. And I saw it, I told Zenith, my wife, I said, John's going to be in trouble. And sure enough, he rang me up and he said, you haven't seen the emails I'm getting. So these are your great religious figures who at great personal cost, at great personal cost, have attempted to live up to and maintain the very high standards set by the Founding Fathers. So thank you for the work you've done, Secretary Dalton. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed. I'm Steve Samuel. I'm co-founder of the DC Interfaith Peace Initiative. I'm, uh, the other co-founder is here in the audience. Her name is Zandra Bayless. You may know our names or may not, but you gracefully paved the way that we could have your three students speak to a group we gathered at the Friends Meeting in Washington called Abraham's Tent. Um, so we were very appreciative of that. Steve, thank you so much. I've reached the stage when I'm about to retire and hand it over to them to spread the word. <laughs> You're doing a wonderful job. Uh, I wanted to ask you, I, you, I believe you're Sufi is in, in Islam. You're Sufi, are you not? Steve, a true Sufi will never say yes to that question. Remember that? <laughs> okay, I'm serious about that. I, I meet too many Muslims who say, well, I'm a Sufi, can I have another drink? Or I, uh, uh, be, be careful, I don't want anyone to scratch my Rolls Royce outside. So I'm, I'm just me, and I hope God will understand who I am. You answered it perfectly. And now we're in the realm of the mystical, so that's good. Um, and I'm wondering, with your background, as you journeyed, and I haven't gone to your index of your book yet, but I'm wondering if you've got any resistance of being thought of as Sufi among the Muslim Americans. Very interesting question, very interesting and complex question. Uh, unfortunately, Steve, you're right, there is a lot of pressure on Sufis from a lot of Muslims within the community, especially those who are influenced, I will not take names, but from certain Muslim countries who have a certain very literalist interpretation of Islam. And their target, of course, is non-Muslims, but also Sufis. And one of the great tragedies for me personally was the attack on the greatest Sufi shrine in Lahore in Pakistan only a few days ago. And Steve, I will share this with you that my father who had great affection for the Sufis and I suspect he was a Sufi, he took me and introduced me to this Sufi shrine in Lahore many, many decades ago. And every time I entered, 
And I was a modern young man straight back from Cambridge and I said, you know, what is he talking about? What sort of Islam is this? Everyone's sort of lost in their ecstasy and devotions and, and really communicating with God in a very personal manner. And over time, I grew to love that shrine, the peace there that I found. And you would find Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs and Christians in the audience. And that was, an, that was attacked. And I was left really with a sense of great despair. Just before that, they had attacked the Ahmadi uh, community in Lahore, killing about 100 people. And then to blowing up or attempting to blow up Data Saab's shrine in Lahore, which has survived a thousand years. And I gave this example, Steve, that the counterpart to this is Ajmer in India. And Ajmer is in India where very often there are riots between Hindus and Muslims. And that's never been attacked or blown up or any attempt made to, to injure it or harm it. Because again, if you go there, you'll see Hindus and Sikhs and Christians all in the same universal brotherhood of man. And yet this shrine was attacked. So it has saddened me and I know the tensions within Islam that are taking place. And that's why I urge you, I urge you to step back and look at the world of Islam and its relations with America in a more scholarly and objective way so that in the end, we promote what we want is a more peaceful, a more loving, and a more productive world and not end up by hurting ourselves. Thank you. Akbar Ahmed is the chairman of American University's Islamic Studies program in Washington, D.C. He was High Commissioner of Pakistan to the United Kingdom. For more information, visit American.edu slash SIS.